Good evening and, and, and welcome to our next in series of, of lectures. Um, I'll remind you next week we have Nusrat Malik who's going to discuss the history of Pakistan post-1990. Um, but this week we have Bill Martin and he is um, graduated from Abilene Christian and then went to Harvard and then got his PhD at Harvard Divinity and then was a professor at Rice University for 40 years and in the sociology department. And he's also uh, wrote the biography of Billy Graham. Yep. And <laughs> <laughs> is a pretty much renowned expert in, in Christian right and fundamentalism. And he's also just back from working on <coughs> trying to rehabilitate the drug laws in America. And just had to be more that's fair. That's fair. Over, fair. Overthrow. Overthrow the drug laws. <laughs> <laughs> but tonight he's going to speak on fundamentalism in Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, and compare and contrast, or contrast the uh, idea concept. And I, I'm going to go Thank you. I, I trust I'm allowed to sit here. Well, in the talking, uh, talk about fundamentalism, I'm using the term not in a, in a pejorative sense, but just to, to refer to, to movements that seek to uh, reassert or to assert the, what they regard as the basic foundational fundamentals of their particular, in this case, religious groups. You can have fundamentals of different, fundamentalisms of different kinds, but I think it, it, it fits best with uh, respect to religion. Um, I distinguish between fundamentalism and orthodoxy. The orthodox are more concerned to preserve a traditional view. And the fundamentalists, as I'm thinking of them, are people who are more confrontational, more oppositional. They, fu fundamentalism arises because they feel that they are under threat and that they want to reestablish what they think is, is necessary for, for the world to, to, to run correctly. The threat, over simply stated, is uh, a, a modernization and secularization. Contrary to what is often assumed, that modernization itself does not necessarily lead to secularization. The United States, by almost any measure that one can think of, is among the most modern uh, countries in the world. It's high on any, almost any. Uh, measure of, of, of modernity or modernization, and yet it's also one of the most religiously vital uh, countries in the world. So they are not necessarily related. However, modernity or perhaps more, more properly modern consciousness does have a, an, an impulse towards secularization. As more and more realms of social life, the economy, education, military, uh, um, justice system, as more, more and more of these move out from under the sacred canopy, as they operate without uh, benefit of clergy, without uh, appealing to, to, to divinity, then in, to that extent societies can be, can be spoken of as, as secular. And that is seen as a threat to, to many people, to, to religious fundamentalists who believe, let's get them back under this sacred canopy so that they answer to, to, to God on these measures. Um, fundamentalists tend also to reject the separation of the sacred and the secular. We speak of it in terms of church-state separation, but other societies would speak of it in other ways. But they, not wanting the state or the governments to be secular, but to let's, let's uh, bring this back into, uh, uh, into harmony with each other. It's probably strongest, I think it is strongest, in, among Muslims, who, uh, many of whom are making a conscious effort to reestablish their societies under the, the rule of Sharia, the, the uh, Muslim law. It's moderated somewhat by in, the, in the United States by a strong um, 
tradition of church-state separation, which, but certainly which is under fire. And among, among Jews, it, it, in, in Israel particularly, it, uh, in, in the United States, um, Jews know that they benefit greatly from the separation of church and state. In Israel, you have some, some true warring factions of people uh, often um, within religious groups, some very devout and some two different very devout groups who have quite different views on, on this uh, idea of whether or not the state and the religion ought to be separate. I think it's possible to look at some, to delineate some common characteristics that virtually all fundamentalist groups share, or at least it, it's fair to say that fundamentalist groups tend to share. One of these is that they often look or think in terms of a golden age, looking back to a perfect time that they would like to, to recreate. It might be the, the era of the, of the early church, the New Testament church, the perfect time when, when uh, the, the Christianity was just, just what it ought to, ought to have been. Might be early America. Uh, think of the, this country as a city set on a hill. I, I, for Muslims, it might be the, the time in Medina when the, when the prophet Muhammad was alive and assisted by his noble companions and that, that perfect early community. It might be for Jews, the Lithuanian shuttle, when Judaism was practiced as they, they feel it ought to be. For some people, it was the 1950s, you know, when everything was, was, was just perfect, especially for white people. Um, so people have their different times when they want to go back to, but they want to go back to the way it was. And that, that's a common characteristic of fundamentalists to look, at, to look back to a golden age. And of course, uh, particularly, well, in, in, in all three of these fundamentalisms that, that I want to talk about tonight, you have the, the story of the Garden of Eden, um, present in the Bible, of course, for Christians and Jews, but also present in the Quran. Uh, attention is given to the, to the, to the Garden uh, of Eden. So that is one characteristic. Another characteristic is an authoritarian view of God, a view of God that enables them to be willing to separate the believers from the unbelievers, the saved from the unsaved, to draw sharp distinctions between those who are in and those who are out. And um, typically with very little tolerance for any kind of shades of gray. Another is the strong belief in the authority of, of scripture and, and also of, of tradition, a, a rejection of critical history, of empirical science, and often of human reason, and of schools that uh, foster these, that emphasize these, so that often the people, I talked to uh, someone just within the last two or three days who's the, was talking about the son of a Rice professor who has become very much in, involved in religious fundamentalism and has told his children you will not go to college. You will learn a trade. You will not go to college because when you go to college, you will learn things that will separate you from that will separate you from God. So there, and of course, the, the movement of homeschooling, a great deal of the of the private religious schools re reflects this uh, belief that there's one kind of schooling. We don't want any kind of schooling that would be a challenge to us. Um, it's characteristic of fundamentalisms to to use a uh, simple phrase, to major in minors, to be concerned about such things as um, alcohol, pornography, dancing, mixed swimming, um, various other kinds of, I could, I could go down the list from my own background of the things I was prohibited from doing. Um, profanity, proper kinds of modest dress, separation of the sexes, things, things of this nature with less attention to such matters as justice, mercy, Faith, war and peace, capital punishment, the environment, things uh, of, this, uh, of this nature. Fundamentalisms tend to be patriarchal with women in a, in a subordinate position and doing pretty much whatever their, their men tell them to do. There is, as I've already suggested, a preference for theocracy, for to, to regard the separation of the, of the state and the religion as, as a bad thing. And there is... Um, a movement now in Christian fundamentalism, in the in the Christian right, that uh, is really pretty widespread, to say that the whole idea of 
church-state separation is just is a bogus idea. That's a misreading of history. Um, it's not a misreading of history. If you care to uh, read something I've written on that, you can go to the bakerinstitute.org website and look up a paper I've written called Secular State Religious People, which um, is, is my take on the importance of the separation of church and state and how that, that it is firmly rated, root, rooted in the Constitution. There's also a, a fundamentalist claim, and there's often a claim of, um, of absolute knowledge. We know all that we need to know, and absolute values. The values we have are set for all time, which is a rejection of the relativism that tends to be more uh, characteristic of, of modernity, of, of, the mo of the modern age. Shortly after coming back to, to Houston from having been at Harvard, I, people often ask, how, did, how do you get from Abilene Christian College to, to Harvard? I say, you head out toward Fort Worth and turn left. <laughs> but, uh, um, on several occasions, I was asked to speak at, at uh, Churches of Christ, which I grew up in, and uh, which I'm not uh, here to, uh, to say bad things about, but I was asked to speak at these churches and talk about things, various kinds of things. And on more than one occasion, I had someone say, you have read too many books. And my answer to that is, what do you think's about the right number? But there is, uh, there is often this, this sense of, um, we know, we know what we need to know, and so studying these other things can, can be dangerous. And fundamentalisms tend to share an, a, a belief in the end of history, that there will be a time when history ends, a golden age, the Messiah will come, a new age, a new realm will, will, will appear. And that's characteristic not only of fundamentalisms, but it, it, it does tend to be characteristic of fundamentalism. Now, let's spend a little time looking at these um, individual movements and say, see if, how these, these characteristics that I have mentioned here, how they fit in, and also just to provide some uh, background information on them. Christian fundamentalism really occurred in two major waves, and I think it's important to look at the first wave in order to understand the, the second one, which is, is currently among us. In the probably no, no time in a, when America was more of a Christian nation and in fact an evangelical Christian nation than at about the middle of the 19th century. The, prominent, uh, the predominant form of Christianity was Protestant and evangelical and evangelical Christians were involved in a wide range of social reform efforts, reforming prisons, dealing with, with, foreign, with fallen women with uh, not foreign fallen women, <laughs> but uh, with, um, um, with prison reform and a number of things like this. And it, it seemed that this was, this was just moving on wonderfully. In fact, Charles Grandison Finney, one of the great uh, evangelists in his time, equivalent to what Billy Graham has been over the last half century, uh, Charles Grandison Finney once wrote that if things keep on improving, in to, it, to the extent that they are going, keep on going the way they're going now, I expect that the kingdom of God will break in within three years. Um, so he, was, he thought things were actually going very, very well. Well, the Civil War cast a bit of a shadow on perfection, and following the Civil War, several developments occurred that really broke up this evangelical Protestant hegemony. One of these, of course, was, the, was Darwin's theory of evolution. If evolution was true, then the Bible was not needed to explain how humans, how the world, how the, the, the various species came to be, and it pretty much negated at least the literal truth of the, the story of Genesis and, and other things in, in the Bible. At about the same time, there came to this country, it's imported to this country from, from Germany, German biblical criticism. Biblical criticism that looked at the, began to look at the Bible as it looked at other forms of literature, as it uh, looked at just that the Bible was developed as along in the same kinds of ways that other religious myths were developed, that other 
fables, folk stories, other things, were, were put together not by, simply by the inspiration of, of by, by inspired writers, but coming together from a number of different sources. And because of that, susceptible to the kind, same kinds of mistakes or criticisms or inconsistencies that you find in other, other writings. And this, as it was, insofar as it was accepted, undercut the confidence that people had in, in, the, in the scriptures. A third development, very important, was immigration. Widespread immigration that involved uh, Jews, who, some of whom were religious Jews, many of whom were, were atheist Jews. It involved great uh, influx of, of Roman Catholics, of Greek Orthodox, of Southern Europeans whose ways were, were, were different than Northern Europeans. It just broke up the sort of the, the really waspish uh, hegemony that, that had obtained in the United States. And along with that was urban, greater urbanization and industrialization and with, the, and with the, the, the kind of ills that often come with cities, particularly when they just when they, when they, uh, occur so quickly. And there were large sections of major cities in which there would be no churches whatever. So there were, there were really efforts, uh, developments that worked against the kind of easy expectations of everyone's believing pretty much the same, the same thing. Now, in response to that, developed fundamentalism, what we call fundamentalism. And they, they had had several characteristics to it. One of these was uh, biblical literalism, the belief to which, as a, as a direct response to this German biblical criticism, an insistence that the Bible was literally true in, in every respect. And interestingly, that was the, the, the hard theoretical work that was done on that was done at Princeton Theological Seminary. And the, the doctrine that came out of it, or the, the view that came out of it, was called the Princeton Theology. I love that. Um, we didn't, nothing comparable happened at Harvard. Uh, but, uh, but more than that, uh, be, 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 because it happened where it happened. Uh, a few years ago, I was invited to speak to, uh, on, this, on this subject to an all-day conference in, uh, in Philadelphia at Christ Church Episcopal where Benjamin Franklin is buried and where when he attended, he went, but uh, he, was not, he, did not, uh, he was not a regular attender or a daily Bible reader, I think. But in any case, when they asked me to come, they said, we want you to come up here and talk to us about this, this southern phenomenon of fundamentalism. Fine, I'll come. And, but when I began my talk, I just said, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And it's certainly fitting to talk about fundamentalism in this city, which is the, was the organizational, theological, intellectual fountainhead of fundamentalism in America. And just <laughs> <laughs> They, they were surprised and, and, and listened even more carefully after that. Uh, but with this, with this belief of biblical literalism, every fact is true. Dissenters could be ostracized. Tests could be developed to, to smoke out unbelievers. And people could be put out of churches, put out of pulpits, taken off radio programs eventually when radio became more popular. Um, churches could be split over, over these issues. A second characteristic, and utterly dependent upon biblical literalism, was premillennialism. The belief that Jesus is going, is going to, there's going to be a millennium. Charles Grandison Finney believed in a millennium, but he thought things were going to improve up to the point that then the kingdom of God would break in, the millennium would break in. The premillennialists believed things were going downhill and that the only way the millennium was going to break in was Jesus was going to come again, and then the millennium would, would occur. And typically there, things would get so bad. Um, there was a along with that was the belief in the rapture. The rapture is not mentioned in the Bible. It, it was developed in the middle of the 19th century by um, uh, John Nelson Darby, uh, a Scottish Britisher, and apparently 
got part of the idea from a dream a young woman had told him. But he worked that into a full, a full, full theological scheme, which is really the basis of this fabulously uh, best-selling Left Behind novels by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins that have sold now close to 70 million copies over the past few years. And if you, you see, I know you know something about this, but if you see the, the bumper sticker, in case of the rapture, this car will be unoccupied. I've always wondered one that says, in case of the rapture, can I have your car? <laughs> but, uh, uh, <clears throat> but there's a whole, whole scheme that lays out what's, what everything means and what, what it means for the, what the United Nations mean and all, all of these things uh, as part of this premillennial scheme. As in, in a more systematic way, they, a group of um, scholars, the, the, the top fundamentalist scholars, some very smart men, were recruited by two men, Milton and Lyman Stewart, who founded the Union Oil, Union Oil Company, the, the big 76 um, signs out on, particularly on the West Coast now. There was, that was their oil company. Uh, Mr. Pugh was, the, was the, another big founder of a big, big supporter of conservative Christianity and gave an enormous amount of money to Billy Graham over the years. But Milton and Lyman Seward commissioned these books, a, a set of a dozen pamphlets or small books called The Fundamentals of the Faith or just Fundamentals of the Faith. And they, atta they, they approached all sorts of issues, evolution, biblical criticism, all, a number of these issues like this, and sent these to every minister and every theological student in the country that they could, that they, whose name they could find. And, and that, it was that set of books that really gave the name fundamentalism to this movement. Then in, in um, they were published between 1910 and 1915. Then in 1919, the World Christian Fundamentals Association met with uh, several thousand leaders in Philadelphia. And that, that did further to uh, popularize the particular name of, of fundamentals. The, as I said at the beginning, fundamentalists tend to like to fight. And they decided that they would take on the, what they call the modernists in their, dis, in their denominations. This occurred primarily in the North, again, and primarily among Presbyterians and Baptists. And they argued about who was right and who was wrong and tried to get the, 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 the liberals out um, in one uh, interesting, well, um, Harry Emerson Fosdick was one of the more dynamic, one of the better known preachers in the country, and he was gradually moved out of the churches that he was preaching in, and uh, John D. Rockefeller built um, the, what's the name of the big church? Riverside, Riverside built Riverside Church so that Harry Emerson Fosdick would have a place to preach without being um, um, oh, mischarged, mischarged or, or harassed in, in any particular way. Um, the evolution, although it was an issue in the, in the North, in fact, um, one preacher wrote, um, Shall the Fundamentalist Win? And a fundamentalist preacher wrote another book that was just as famous, Shall the Funny Monkeyist Win? <laughs> so they argued over this. But the, but the real fight over fundamentalism occurred, I mean, over evolution, occurred in the South, of course. It was only in the South did a number, in the Southwest, uh, did a number of states actually make efforts. Most of them failed, but make efforts to, uh, to uh, outlaw the teaching of evolution. And of course, the most famous case of that was in Tennessee, where John Scopes was tried for, in 1925 for teaching evolution. I'm, you're probably aware of the fact that Scopes wasn't exactly picked on and, and persecuted for this, that uh, there was a conscious effort made to test out the, the legality of these laws. And the ACLU was, it was one of their first cases that they ever used to try to, to, to uh, challenge such things and brought in Clarence Darrow and, and his friend H.L. Mencken to come in and um, to, to try scopes against William Jennings Bryan, who was the, uh, the great 
fundamentalist, the, the best known, one of the best known men in America, and most revered and, and admired men in America, um, and did many good things. And it's, it's a shame he just gets remembered, gets remembered now mainly for the Scopes trial, but by many people. But in any case, that even though Scopes was uh, convicted, uh, fined a hundred dollars, somebody else paid it for him, and he left and went off to the University of Chicago and got a degree in something else and wound up, I think, his, in the rest of his life teaching in San Antonio. <laughs> but, uh, uh, <clears throat> but fundamentalism was made sport of widely. It was this, the, the trial was covered widely and uh, Dayton, Tennessee became something of a laughing stock place. In the early 1920s, it looked like fun, I mean, fundamentalism was on a roll. It had William Jennings Bryan, it had Billy Sunday, two of the most admired men in the country, were, were the leaders of their ranks. Prohibition had just been passed. It looked like that just things were going better and better and better and that the fundamentalists might win and then whoo, it just, they began to lose their churches, they began to be made fun of, the Scopes trial came, and they went into a, a period of wilderness wandering. Many pundits at the time said that fundamentalism would probably dis disappear soon, but of course it didn't. And in the, in the period between 1925 and World War I, or World War, the beginning of World War II, fundamentalism regrouped in a number of ways, in a ways that, that often were, were missed by much, of the, by much of the population. But they began to form a variety of fundamentalist alliances, sort of smaller, smaller versions of the World Christian Fundamentals Association. There were dozens of these. They formed independent congregations, often headed by a powerful individual preacher, which in many ways are the forerunners of today's megachurches in which one preacher may have several thousand people uh, under, his, under his wing. They established Bible colleges and other institutions that would avoid the corrupting tendencies of the liberal arts. And they developed a great skill, or at least uh, they, they became very prolific in using print media and also in using radio. And they laid down the foundations for what later became known as the, the electronic church for religious broadcasting, which is a primary way in which um, many uh, conservative Christians now operate their, their, um, their ministries. The, this, much of this movement was very reactionary and, and, and hold tight and not, they were more concerned with drawing a circle so that this, here, our, everybody except Cave 73 is going to hell. You know, <laughs> that, that, that draw the circle as, as tightly as possible. But there were other people who were moving away from this, who wanted to be more expansive, who wanted to have a greater contact with the rest of the world, who wanted to engage intellectuals from other um, realms, who wanted to be involved in various kind of social activities or social issues. And these people came to be called, they called themselves the neo-evangelicals as opposed to the fundamentalists. They were, we're going we're to be, we're going to be evangelicals, but we're going to be of a different stripe. We're going to be more concerned with reaching out to the world rather than just war walling ourselves off from the world. And although he wasn't involved at the very beginning, within two or three years, Billy Graham was a major uh, fig figure in this movement, and it's really the, the wing of conservative Evan Protestant Christianity that Billy Graham has been the, the main spokesman and figurehead for that developed out of this in the early 1940s, what came to be the National Association of Evangelicals, and um, that, that has been the, 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 the largest group of, of conservative Protestants since that time. Now, let's fast forward to uh, the second wave of uh, fundamentalist Christianity, from the 1960s and, and forward. And I've been, written more about the Christian right. If you're interested, um, I should have brought a uh, copy of the book to show you, but it's, it's called With God on Our Side, The Rise of the Religious Right in America. And um, it's, in there I've tried to, I've detailed in, in considerable detail, the, the way that the, what we now think of as the religious right or the Christian right, how, how it developed. 
it developed again as fundamentalism often does in reaction. It, there were a reaction to several to a series of catalyzing events and. and